I understand now to handle over to Peter Lee. Last night at this time, I gave some advice about locking the doors and windows to make certain that you wouldn't be disturbed. But evidently not everyone heeded my warning. It seems that quite a lot of you received rather a nasty shock when that door slowly opened with a more than ominous squeak, and those curtains started to flutter so noisily. Caused by the wind, was it? Well, if these rather frightening things did happen to you, then I trust that you've learnt your lesson, because it's time I introduced you to our last guest, Vincent Price. The Price of Fear, brought to you by Vincent Price. Hello. I'm so happy you're with us again. This story I've called William and Mary. I suppose that most of us have, at some time or another, lain awake in the early hours of the morning and thought about death and the afterlife. I know I have. Or rather, I used to. Until a few years ago, when I had an experience which caused me to... Uh, but let me explain. At that time, I was living in a small university town. Although I was unaware of it, I was actually living only a few hundred yards away from two old friends of mine, William and Mary Pearl. I say old friends, but in fact, I had known Mary when we were students together, and had only met William when Mary married him some years later. I had absolutely no idea that they were even in the same town as I, until one morning, to my utter surprise, a letter arrived from their solicitor, informing me of William's death. He had, it seems, left me a small bequest. Before I begin the reading, I should like to extend my deepest sympathy to the widow of my late friend and client, William Pearl. Thank you. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I shall now read the last will and testament of the late William Arthur Pearl. I, uh, William Arthur Pearl, being of sound mind... As I sat in that rather dreary little office, I found myself staring at Mary. To say that I was shocked by the change in her appearance would be to understate the case. When I first knew her, she had been a lively, pretty girl. Now she had developed a sullen, resentful air, and her whole face gave the impression of having slowly but surely sagged to pieces through years and years of joyless marriage to her husband, William. At first they had been happy enough, but then, as William grew older, he developed a kind of cruel, nagging irritability, which Mary had at first tried to dissuade, then to combat, and finally to accept in silence. I remembered the occasion of our last meeting. Mary and I were sitting in the Pearl flat, waiting for William to return from a lecture. We sat chatting of this and that, and I remember I had offered her a cigarette, which she had accepted and lit without thinking. Oh, what have you done? I shouldn't be thinking, you know. William disapproves. In fact, between ourselves, he disapproves of most things these days. He's changed a lot, you know. He's become almost a caricature of a peevish, pedantic gong. I'm surprised you hadn't noticed it. Really, Mary, you exaggerate, I'm sure. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm embarrassing you. You are also embarrassing me, my oh, dear. Oh, William. Continually refusing to obey my request concerning your smoking. William, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you coming. That's blatantly obvious. Otherwise, you'd hardly be smoking a cigarette and discussing me as though I were a delinquent child. This is really my fault. I, I was asking oh, there's Mary... Oh, no need to be gallant, old man. Mary, it seems, has developed a martyr complex, which can only be alleviated by the consumption of endless numbers of cigarettes. God's sake, must you behave like this in front of friends? Why the hell do you object to my smoking anyway? Afraid I'll get cancer? No, it's not that. Then why can't I smoke? Because I disapprove, that's why. You disapprove of so many things, William. Cigarettes, lipstick, alcohol, children. Especially children. 
Needless to say, as soon as I could decently excuse myself, I, I left this somewhat painful domestic scene. And after that, we rather drifted apart. Indeed, I was surprised that William had remembered me at all, let alone left me something in his will. I even felt that he had begun to resent my very friendship with Mary. And finally, the voice of the Earl, solicitor broke in on my thoughts and brought me back to reality. I have been instructed to give you this sealed envelope. Your late husband sent it to us shortly before he uh, uh, passed away. Since it appears this might contain something of a personal nature, no doubt you prefer to take it with you and read it in private. Yes, thank you. I think I should. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the reading of the last will and testament of the late William Arthur Pearl. Then I'm as well to thank you for coming in uh, to wish you a good day. Good day. Good day, gentlemen. Mary, dear. I'm so glad you came. It's good to see you again. And I'm delighted to see you again, although I could have wished that the meeting had taken place in happier circumstances. Look, why don't you come back for a drink? Now, I mean. Well, are you sure? Wouldn't you rather be alone? No, I'd like you to come, really, I would. I'm afraid I'm not much good at being alone. And this letter worries me a little. I don't know why. Even of course, I, I'd be delighted to come. When we arrived at the Pearl's house, Mary led me straight through to the living room. I remember she didn't even stop to move her coat. As soon as we were settled, she took out the envelope the solicitor had given her and drew out fifteen or so closely written sheets. Slowly, she reached into her handbag, took out her spectacles and put them on. Then, holding the pages high in front of her, she began to read aloud. This note, my dear Mary, is entirely for you and will be given to you shortly after I am gone. It is nothing but an attempt on my part to saying exactly what Dr. Landy is going to do to me. I knew it would be something like this. How could he? Mary, what's the matter, Mary? You, you've gone quite pale. Who is this Dr. Landy? What, what did he do to him? I'll be all right. Here, you take the lesson. Read it to me, please. It will make it easier. Mm -hmm. Hearing all this from a third person. Very well, my dear, if you want me to, but I... I... Please. And of course, yes. Well, let's see, where did we get to? Yes, here we are. The details of the disease that struck me down so suddenly, you know. No need to waste time on them. As I have lain here in hospital with somewhere between one and six months to live, I seem to be growing more melancholy every hour. And then, one Tuesday morning, six weeks ago, my friend John Landy, the neurosurgeon, burst into my room. William, my boy, this is perfect. You're just the one I want. Hello, John. Well, now, in a few weeks' time, you're going to be dead. Correct? Do you believe you'll go to heaven? I doubt it. But what's all this about? Hardly a good bedside manner. In a few weeks, you're going to be dead. Sorry. But look, would you be prepared to consider a proposition? I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. I am serious. Oh, go on. I've very little to lose by listening. On the contrary, you've a great deal to gain, especially after you're dead. This is something I've been working on quietly for some years. A long time ago, I saw a medical film brought over from Russia. It showed a dog's head severed from the body, but with the normal blood supply being maintained. It sounds gruesome, man. The thing is that it was alive. The brain was functioning. Now, my idea, which grew out of seeing that film, was to remove the brain from the skull of a human being and to keep it alive, functioning as an independent unit after he is dead. For example, after you are dead. Good God. I've already completed a number of successful trials with animals and... I'm ready to try it with a human. I don't like it's the idea of one bit. Interrupting and let me finish. Think of it, man. Your own brain. In perfect shape. It crammed full of a lifetime of learning. Yet soon it's going to have to die along with the rest of your body. It's repulsive. What possible use can there be in keeping my brain alive if I couldn't talk or... See or hear or feel. I believe you would be able to communicate with us. But 
And let me explain a bit more. At the very moment of death, I should have to be standing by so that I could step in immediately and try to keep your brain alive. Are you serious about this? Certainly. What would you do? I should immediately open your neck and locate the four arteries, the cartoids and the vertebrals. I should then stick a large hollow needle in each. These four needles would be connected by tubes to the artificial heart. Then, working quickly, I should dissect out the left and right jugular veins and hitch these also to the heart machine to complete the circuit. Now, switch on the machine, which is already primed with the right type of blood, and there you are. The circulation through your brain would be restored. You'd have a dead body and a living brain. Uh, but would it function? Oh, my dear William, how should I know? I can't even tell whether it would ever regain consciousness. And if it did, uh, that would be fascinating. Lying there with all your thinking processes working beautifully, and your memory as well. And not being able to see, feel, hear, or smell. Now, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Minute, wait a minute. I'm going to leave one of your optic nerves intact, as well as the eye itself. I've already constructed a small plastic case to contain the eyeball. And when the brain is in a basin submerged in ringer solution, the eyeball, in its case, will float on the surface of the liquid. Staring at the ceiling. Hilarious. But how could I communicate with you? By means of a sensitive piece of apparatus known as an encephalograph, which records the brain's electrical and chemical discharges on a graph. But do you honestly believe that when my brain is in that basin, my mind will be able to function? That I shall be able to think and reason as I do now? I don't see why not. It's the same brain. It's undamaged. You'd be living in an extraordinarily pure and detached world. No worries, or fears, or pains, or hunger, or thirst. And for you, William, a doctor of philosophy, it would be a tremendous experience. You'd be able to reflect upon the ways of the world with a, a, with a detachment and a serenity that no man has ever attained before. Great thoughts and solutions might come to you, great ideas that could revolutionize our way of life. Mm. But look here, I'm not asking you to make up your mind immediately. Sleep on it. Perhaps you would give me a ring tomorrow. I'll be at home. Yes, all right. I'll think it over and let you know. Hello, John Landy here. Landy, Pearl here. Uh, look, I've been... Thinking over your proposition... And... Yes? What have you decided? Well, my first reaction was one of revulsion, but... Now, well, I'm not so sure. But one thing bothers me, though. What if it were painful, or I became hysterical, there'd be no escape? William, there are always risks connected with any major scientific experiment. But think of the other aspect. Suppose it succeeded. There would be your brain functioning perfectly producing original and imaginative theories. Man, you'd be immortal. Oh, yes. That's what appealed. My brain continuing its work untrammeled by physical considerations. And though I say it myself, I'm rather proud of my brain. It's a damn good one. Well? Yes, John, I'm going to do it. I've decided to go through with it. Splendid. Now, look. I'll be over right away to discuss the... Uh, just one thing, John. Mary, should I tell her? Yes. Uh, I suggest you discuss it with her as soon as possible. Uh, uh, better, I suppose. Although she's hardly likely to realize the importance of such an experiment. It's going to be difficult. Well, why not write it all down? In a letter to be given to her when you're dead. It might be better. Less complicated all around, eh? Yes, I see your point. Well, I'll think about it. Good night for now, John. Goodbye. A letter. Why not? To be open only after my death. Only after my death. 
Now, Mary, I will not say goodbye because there's just a chance that if Landy succeeds, I may actually see you again. I've tried several times to prepare you for this news, but you have constantly refused to give me a hearing. Please change your mind now and give Landy a call. Your faithful husband, William. Oh. There's more, Mary. P.S. Be good when I am gone. Do not drink. Do not smoke. Do not buy a television set. And incidentally, now that I have no further use for it, I suggest you have the telephone disconnected. Oh, really? Aren't I entitled to some peace after all these years? Oh, the, the whole thing is just too awful to think about. Awful and beastly. What are you going to do? Oh, what can I do? I must do as William requests, I suppose. I better ring Dr. Landy now, right away. Just over half an hour later, Mary and I were greeted by a somewhat apprehensive Dr. Landy at the hospital entrance. We followed him in silence through a maze of echoing corridors until finally he stopped at a door marked No Admittance. Well, here we are. I must warn you, it's bound to be a bit of a shock at first. He's not very prepossessing in his present state, I'm afraid. I didn't marry him for his looks, Doctor. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, well, take your time when you get inside. He won't know you're there until you place your face directly above his eye. Of course, he can't hear anything. We can talk as much as we like. It's in here. I wouldn't go too close, yes, until you get used to it. The doctor had ushered us into a small, square room. On a high white table in the center of the room was a biggish white enamel bowl about the size of a wash basin, with half a dozen or so plastic tubes coming out of it. These tubes were connected with a whole lot of glass piping, and I could see the blood flowing from the heart machine. It was this machine which made a soft, rhythmic, pulsing sound. He's in here, in this bowl. Come a little closer. Oh, don't be afraid. That's right. Now, you see this small oval capsule floating on liquid in the bowl? That's the eye in there. Can you see it? Yes. Oh. Take your time. As far as we can tell, it's still in perfect condition. It's his right eye, and the plastic container has a lens on it, similar to the one that he used in his own spectacles. At this moment, he's probably seen quite as well as he ever did. Oh, are you feeling all right, Mrs. Pearl? I think so. Good. Then we'll go forward a little more, and you'll be able to see the whole thing. There you are. That's William. The doctor led Mary forward until she could see right down into the basin. I followed, feeling somewhat nervous, I must confess. William's brain was far larger than I had imagined it would be, and darker in color. With all the ridges and creases running over the surface, it reminded me of nothing so much as a large, pickled walnut. I could see the stubs of the four big arteries and the two veins coming out of the face and the neat way in which they were joined to the plastic tubes. With each throb of the heart machine, all the tubes gave a little jerk in unison as the blood was pushed through them. Now, Mrs. Pearl, you'll have to lean over and put your face right above the eye. 
He'll see you then, and you can smile. I'd say a few nice things as well. He won't actually hear them, but I'm sure he'll get the idea. It must have taken tremendous courage for Mary to lean over that basin and stare into the eye that had once been her husband. The eye itself was bright and stared at her with a peculiar fixed intensity. There was no doubt that it was watching her, and the small needle on the nearby control panel, which I took to be the encephalograph, flicked as Mary spoke, while at the same time the machine emitted a curious clicking sound. Hello, dear. It's me, Mary. How are you, dear? Are you feeling all right, will you? I got your letter, dear, and came at once to see how you were. Dr. Landy says you're doing wonderfully well. They're doing everything possible to take care of you, dear. You seem fine. Really, you do. That's excellent, Mrs. Pearl, excellent. How strange. I've been trying to think what it is that's different about the eye. I see it now. There's a softness about it which William has never had. William's eyes used to glint at you, stabbing into the brain almost. This eye has a softness and a gentleness that's almost cow like are you quite sure he's conscious? Oh, yes, completely. And he can see me perfectly. Isn't that marvelous? I expect he's wondering what's happened. Not at all. He knows perfectly well where he is and why he's here. You mean he knows he's in the basement? Of course. And if he only had the power of speech, he would probably be able to carry on a perfectly normal conversation. So far as I can see... There should be absolutely no difference mentally between this William here and the one you used to know at home. Good gracious me. You know, I'm not at all sure that I don't prefer him as he is at present. I believe I could live very comfortably with this kind of wood. I could cope with this one. Quiet, isn't he? Naturally, he's quiet. Doctor, I do believe I'm beginning to feel the most enormous affection for him. Does that sound clear? I think it's understandable. He looks so helpless, lying there in the basement. He's like a baby. Me like a little baby. There. From now on, Mary's going to look after you. All by herself. When can I have him back home, Doctor? Oh, uh, he couldn't possibly be moved. I don't see why not. But this is an experiment, Mrs. Pearl. It's my husband, Doctor. Uh, but, uh, it is my husband, you know. <laughs> That's rather a tricky point. Perhaps it would be better if we were to discuss this matter more fully in my office. I mean it. I want him back. Mary and the doctor had become so engrossed in the struggle for possession of William, or rather what remained of him, that they had forgotten my presence completely. I... I watched him fall. The doctor was studying Mary as she calmly put a cigarette between her lips and lit it. He obviously regarded her as a very queer fish indeed, even allowing for the bizarreness of the situation. Mary walked over to the window, apparently quite calm and relaxed, puffing a cigarette. Then she walked back to the table and looked into the basin once more. Mary's leaving you now, sweetheart. Don't you worry about a single thing. You understand? I'm going to get you home again. Just as soon as I possibly can. And... At this point, 
Mary paused and put a cigarette to her lips, intending to take a part. Instantly, the eye flashed, and the pupil contracted into a minute black point of distilled fury. At the same time, the needle on the graph jumped along. Mary didn't move for a moment. She stood looking down into the basin, holding the cigarette to her mouth and watching the eye. Then, slowly and deliberately, she put the cigarette to her lips, inhaled deeply, held the smoke, then suddenly... She released the smoke through her nostrils in two thin jets, which struck the water and billowed out over the surface in a thick blue cloud which completely enveloped the eye. The needle on the grass machine went mad. The doctor, who had been standing with his back to Mary since she crossed to the table, turned suddenly, aware that something had happened, but not knowing what. I think perhaps we'd better leave now. Now, don't look so cross, William. It isn't any good looking cross. Not anymore, dear. Because from now on, my pet, you're going to do exactly what Mary tells you. Do you understand, William? Exactly what Mary tells you. Mrs. Pearl. So don't be a naughty boy again, will you, my pet? Naughty boys are liable to get most severely punished. That's enough, Mrs. Pearl. Yes, of course. Goodbye, darling. I'll be back soon. I just can't wait to get him home again. I think it was Bernard Shaw who said, There are two tragedies in life. One is to lose one's heart's desire. The other is to gain it. Poor William with his vain dreams of his detached brain solving the world's problem. Is he still alive in his basin, consumed with impotent rage as he views Mary's excesses of tobacco, alcohol, and television? And what of Mary? Can she still be enjoying her protracted revenge for all those years of domestic misery? I think she can. For well, Mary was taught cruelty by an expert. As for myself, nowadays my sleep is undisturbed by thoughts of death and immortality. Although I must confess I have never since been able to wash my hands in an enamel basin without thinking of William and Mary. That was Vincent Price bringing you The Price of Fear. Also starring in William and Mary were John Barron, Gerard Green, and Hilda Schroeder with Terry Scully. William and Mary was first recounted by Roe Dark, dramatized by Barry Campbell, and produced by John Dyer. You might like to ponder my story for tomorrow night. It takes place in Bavaria, when I went to look over a medieval castle there, and the horrifying event that befell the three tourists and myself when we visited the blood-soaked torture chamber. <laughs> Sounds gruesome, doesn't it? I do hope that that will tempt you to join me tomorrow. Good night. <laughs>